are standing. We start a new journey tonight. How many enjoyed the book of James? Oh, I've studied and memorized the book of James, and every time I study it and read it, I get excited again. But tonight we begin the journey of one of the great books of the New Testament, the book of Colossians. Oh, I'm glad you're so excited. This series is entitled, Jesus is Lord, a study of the book of Colossians. We want to talk tonight about making Jesus the Lord of our city, to impact our city. And we're going to be reading from verses 1 through verse 12. Let's read. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Read it right out loud. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you everybody repeat that phrase doing what? say it again praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, everybody stop there for a moment. Why is he praying for them? Because what did he hear? He heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. He's never been to this church. All right, this is going to be cool. You're going to find something out about Apostle Paul, and you're going to find out something tonight, how we can impact this city and impact the state of Texas. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? All right, just checking. Of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. As you learn from Epaphras, everybody say Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, now everybody say for this reason, we also since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk in the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and suffering with joy. Giving, giving, giving. To the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That is heavy duty. Let us pray. Father, I'm thankful there are people hungry to know your word and understand it. So I'm asking you tonight to give me an anointing to preach, to share your word with power. God, I'm asking you to do something marvelous tonight. Open our understanding. Cause our minds to be free to truly think your thoughts. To allow this word to come forth in our hearts. May we be changed by it. May this city be changed because of it. And Lord, as we take this journey in the book of Colossians every Wednesday night, we're asking that you would be glorified and exalted. So anoint me. Give me great liberty in preaching and teaching. Anoint your people that they will not only hear the word, but live by it. And we'll be sure to give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. How many have ever read, written a letter to somebody? Let me see your hand. Now you text things today. And we've lost the art of writing letters. But what, what do we do when we write a letter? What's the first thing we say? 
dear so-and-so, right? Right. And then <coughs> what do we do at the end of the letter? Huh? Sincerely yours, and then you give your name, right? So they don't know who's writing them until you get to the very end of the letter, <laughs> right? That's the complete opposite of the way they wrote letters in ancient times. Because in ancient times, the first thing they did is the person who's writing the letter introduces himself. Now, this is very interesting. He introduces himself, and he de clearly declares to the people he's writing who he is. Now you say, wait a minute, hold it, Pastor, stop. Uh, why is he doing that? Well, number one, that's the way you wrote ancient letters. You always introduced yourself to the person you're writing to so they know from the beginning who's talking story with them, as we say in Hawaii. Who's talking to them? But you'll notice something else here. Paul starts by saying, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Now you say, why would he say that? It's because they needed to know the fact that he is not only somebody writing them, but they need to know very clearly that he is an apostle of Jesus. He has authority. He's not just writing a, oh, hi, how are you doing kind of a letter. This is a letter that comes from an apostle that has great authority and that he is dealing with some issues that are happening in the church. I've often wondered why people get so upset when a pastor talks about dealing with issues in the church. That's all Paul ever wrote about was issues in the church and how to fix them. And I'm glad he did because he helps us to fix the problems today. Somebody say amen. So he's introducing himself and he clearly declares who he is, and he mentions Timothy. Now, why in the world does he mention Timothy? Well, probably because he may be known to the church there in Colossae, but primarily it's because, I think, Timothy is the one who is writing the letter as Paul is dictating it. Now, the reason we know that is because uh, at the end of this book, in chapter 4, verse 18, Paul does something very strange. He says these words. He says, um, I write this greeting in my own hand. Now, what he's saying is, I'm not writing this letter. Somebody else is writing it. I'm dictating it to him. But so that you know that this is from me, I'm writing my signature in my own hand, my, my, my greeting. Now, Think about that for a moment. When you read this letter in the Greek language, you'll notice that the vocabulary and uh, the writing style is different than oftentimes how Paul has written. So we know that Timothy had a strong uh, part of this letter. Timothy was his son in the faith. You'll also know that he tells us who the letter is written to. And... Uh, he gives a profound description of the church. Everybody listen, because this is crucial. You're attending a church here tonight. If you were going to define this church to somebody else, what would you say? Well, we have a little byline. We say that uh, you come to kings and experience life with people, power, and purpose. But how does Paul define a church? Well, look at what he says. It's a profound description. Look at, how he, look at how he says this. It's amazing to me. Are you ready? Look at this. He says, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, who are the saints? What does the word saint mean? The word saint in the Greek language is a word, it's the way you describe it. It's called hagios. The best way to remember it is haagen ice cream. Everybody say hagios. Now, saints mean holy ones. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. I'm, I, I'm not really that holy. Well, you have been made holy by the blood of the Lamb. 
Now what God is requiring of us is to live holy. I, I think we probably should have had a bigger amen on that statement. That we are called to live holy. So he is declaring to them who they are. They're saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Now, it's amazing. They're faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, think about what he's just said. He's defined the church as holy and faithful, made up of holy and faithful people, people full of faith, people that do God's will because that they're being faithful to God's will. How, how, how many say, oh, he's talking about me. Praise Jesus. Some of you said, oh, I don't know if I'm there. That's where God wants you to be. But he says something else. He says, in essence, faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, you say, well, well, what, what's that about? It's not just the location of where the church is, Colossae. It's a city. But he is saying, you are the family of God that represent God in your city. Whether we like it or not, we are the representative of God in this city. Now, you say, well, what about the other churches? They're the same. The biggest point, however, is we need to let our light shine so that what? The Bible says that, that they may do what? Anybody remember? Let your light so shine among men that they may... Huh? Let your light so shine among men that they may... See your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Can't do that unless you're willing to be holy and faithful. What if God spoke to you to do a task? And you said, well, you know, I'm really, I really, I, you know what? I, I did that before, but I don't like doing that. I ain't going to do that again. Okay. Oh, nobody would do that. Uh, give me a break. A lot of people do that. Oh, well, you know, I just don't have time anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm too old. I use that on God, but it doesn't work. He says, I'm forever. <laughs> he reminds me of a Filipino pastor I had on my staff, Pastor Alcantara. I constantly refer to him because... He joined my staff at 83, died at 106, kept preaching till he was 100. I'm a kid. I'm 74. I haven't warmed up yet. But I feel my age. Now think about it for a moment. How many of you have ever been asked by the Lord? Now you don't have to raise your hand. I am here to condemn anybody. But how many, just think about it. How many times have you been asked by the Lord to do something and you just didn't feel like you wanted to do that. Well, some of you raised both hands, so thank you, Eric, for that statement back there. But we've all had that experience. I went through it myself. You know, I pastored for 43 years on Maui, uh, one of the largest churches in the state, and one, one of the largest churches today in America. We're in, we're in what, 615 congregations? And thousands of people, all of that stuff. And he says, I want you to go to Dallas. I want you to go to Dallas. I want you to take over the extension we began 14 years ago, but it's gone through a real difficult time. This, this whole facility was destroyed during the fr freeze, and just so many things happened. I've appreciated so much those who kept the light on here, the Joneses and, of course, our Spanish pastor. They kept the light on. And uh, then God said, I want you to go. I thought, that is unusual. Uh, God, do you remember how old I am? I'm not a 30-year-old man that I was when I went to Maui 43 years ago. I'm 74. My brain doesn't work the same. Neither does my body. <laughs> and besides, my, my wife will never want to leave Maui. And you know the story. I've made a long list of all the things that said, I can't go unless you do this. Well, he did them all, so I didn't have any more excuses. 
and I came. And many of you have done the same. We've had people that have come all from everywhere, from Alaska, from Louisiana, from, I mean, just everywhere. We, they all just showed up here when, we, when we, we began to believe that God was going to write a new story on Story Road. Some of you are brand new to this house, and you came, and you just felt like you ought to come. Some of you have, have come in the past, and, and you said, hey, I'm going to come back. I said, praise Jesus. You say, Pastor, what's happening? Well, what's happening is God's raising up a community in this place that will be his example of grace to this community and to this state. And you'll notice what takes place. You'll notice it real clearly here. He gives a blessing. Can anybody tell me what the blessing is? Grace to you and peace. Everybody say grace to you and peace. Now here's what's interesting. Grace is a word that was very familiar in the Greek culture. Charis is what the word is here. And the word peace is the key word in Hebrew culture. What, what he's doing here is he is suggesting God's blessing, whether you be a Jew or a Gentile, is going to meet you at the point of your need. Grace and peace, shalom in Hebrew. And that means everything you'd ever need or want. Grace, oh my, unmerited favor. When God gives you favor when you don't deserve it. Whoa! We all need that. How many think that's a good plan? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, grace to you and peace. <laughs> then you begin to get a glimpse of Paul's prayer. He begins to pray, and he says something. He starts there in verse 3 with thanksgiving, and he begins to list the things he's thankful for. Now, let me stop here just for a moment. How many of you, when you pray for somebody, you start by thanking God for who they are and what they've done? So oftentimes, when we pray for people, we don't even remember a bit of what they've done or what they are or anything about them. In fact, if you're praying for your enemy, you're saying, God, strike them dead. Just clobber them, kill them. That's not a good prayer. One of the things we need to learn about is that we begin our prayer life with thanksgiving. In the early morning prayer meetings, if you were there in the morning, you'll notice that what I do, we begin that prayer time thanking God and praising Him. I could go on for a whole half an hour just doing that. Just thanking him for what he's done, all the little details of my life, thanking him for who he is. My, 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 my. You could even sing songs of thanksgiving. But he says, listen to what, we give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say something here for some of you that theologically are struggling. Maybe somebody knocked on your door with a tie and... I don't think, do they still wear white shirts and ties now? And uh, some drive bicycles and some walk. Both of them are heresies. Now, let me just tell you why. Because of their view of Jesus. Jesus is not a lesser God. And if you're from India, one of the things you'll notice in India, they have hundreds, if not thousands of gods, and Jesus is just one of them on the God shelf. Uh, that's not the Jesus I know. And sometimes when people talk about God, if you're not careful, I had a Hare Krishna knock on my door one day, and I'm familiar with Hinduism. I was born in India. It's Hinduism. And so he was wanting a donation. His concept of God was not the same concept of God that I had. He was soliciting for me to give to a demonic power something that belonged to God. I have no problem blessing people no matter who they are. That's never been a problem for me. If somebody's in need, I will give. That's what I do, all right? But to ask me to give a, a gift to a God that is not God is a problem for me. 
Does that make sense? Now here's what this is saying. The Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what he's saying here? Number one, the word Lord. Everybody say Lord. Lord. Now, in Hebrew, I was taking a Hebrew class in graduate school, and I've shared this many times. The way the teacher taught us Hebrew is you had to stand and read your Hebrew Bible out loud. There's only one problem with the Hebrew Bible. There's a, there's, it looks like a word, but it's not a word because there's no what we would know in English vowels. There's no vowels in between four consonants. Y-H-W-H. You can't pronounce it in Hebrew. There's no possible way. There's no, there's no vowels. So my mistake was I tried to pronounce it, and everybody laughed. Well, they should have. Because when you come to that word, you are to say the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. When Paul says the Lord, he is saying this is not just a nice fellow. This is the Lord. This is God himself. The Lord Jesus. Jesus is his humanity. Lord is his divinity. And Christ, that's the Greek word for Messiah, the anointed one, the promised savior of the world. World. That particular little phrase tells you of the very nature of who Jesus is. So everybody say it with me. Say it as loud as you can. On three, ready? One, two, three. The Lord Jesus Christ. Well, come on, come on, come on, help me out. Help me out, help me out. Don't freak out on me. Come on, ready? On three. One, two, three. The Lord Jesus Christ. Powerful. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is the Lord. Wow. At the name of Jesus, demons flee. At the name of Jesus, people are healed. Oh, don't get me started. How awesome. Well, he starts with thanksgiving. And you'll notice that he thanks them for what he has heard. Now, when you say what he's heard, why? He's never been there. He's the apostle for this church, but he's never been there. His representative is that man, Epaphras. And you say, well, pastor, how does that work? I'll tell you exactly what happened. When you read the book of Acts, chapter 19, you will notice roughly in around 52 A.D. to about 55 A.D., one of the greatest revivals in Asia Minor took place. It took place in the city of Ephesus. And it clearly says that the entire area of Asia Minor heard the gospel. It was one of the greatest revivals Paul was ever a part of. In that revival, he taught at the school of Tyrannus, ministry. One of his students was this man, Epaphras, and he sent him to start churches. He opened three churches, and you'll notice it here. He opened a church in Colossae. He opened a church. Anybody else can find out where those churches are? Do you see it in the text? We'll get there in a moment. But he opened three churches. Now, think about that for a moment. Here's a person. He wasn't an apostle. He was just a lover of God. He said, I want to be used by God. And he did that. So he's now having some problems in the church. So Paul now is in prison. He's, he's not in prison. He's under house arrest in Rome. This is about 62 A.D., about seven years later. He goes to Rome, spends some time with the apostle Paul, shares with him some of the problems the church is having. Now, here's what's interesting. The problems the church was having are the exact same problems that the church in America is having right now. How could that be? Same devil. Same fallen humanity. And the interesting thing about it, when we read this and we point out some of those problems, you're going to go, oh, my but they're happening in our own heads, even today. Boy, this is a good book. I said, this is a good book. 
Well, he starts thanking for their faith. But not just their faith. Their faith is being lived out. You say, how are they being lived out? Because they love the saints. Did you know one aspect of your faith is your ability to love? Don't tell me you're a person of faith if you don't have enough faith to love somebody that you're married to. Well, I didn't know she was that way. I didn't know he was that way. Oh, give me a break. You knew that. You just, you just love them. And somehow in the course of time, that love began to wane. It could be because your faith waned. Boy, it's quiet in here. I'm sorry. He thanked them for their hope of the heavenly realities. They had a hope in the marvelous picture of heaven, which is laid up for you in heaven. He, he's excited because he heard that they are sharing the word of truth. You'll notice that if, he said the gospel is being spread all over the place through you guys. In fact, you will notice that that's exactly what's happened in this ministry. He's you will know very clearly that Epaphras has opened a church in Hierapolis, Laodicea, and right here in Colossae. Everybody listen to me. You say, Pastor, why would you pastor a church in Maui on a little island and impact that island profoundly and then try to start churches everywhere else? It's because there's a fire happening. Amen. And the fire is in our soul. And God put that fire there because he's concerned about everybody being saved. So our goal as a church is to be one church in 1,200 congregations by the end of 2025. That's only about two years from now. So that means we got a lot of work to do. That means there may be some Epaphrases right here in this church. Well, I'm glad you're so excited. But he says, for the gospel which is spreading all over the world and is bearing fruit and growing. Wow. Oh, I asked for that. I felt like the Lord said, when you go to Dallas, make it a hub. We're going to touch the entire continental United States from this place. We've already, 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 we've taken over a church in Houston. Our team went down there just, what day is it? They went down on Monday. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see that work grow and become strong. I have a building there already, and we're going to do it. And then we've had people say, why don't you open in Waco? So we may just do that too. And who knows, we just may start popping out all over the place. Right now, on Sunday, we have our English congregation, our Slavic congregation, our Marshallese congregation, our Spanish congregation. We have a Spanish group that's meeting right now in a Bible study over in the uh, fireside room. Hallelujah. We're going to have a Tongan congregation. We're going to have an Indian congregation. We're going to have a Japanese and a Korean congregation. If I can find some Hawaiians here, we'll have an Hawaiian congregation. You say, you're crazy. I'm insane. You say, you are? Yeah, I'm insanely in love with Jesus, insanely in love with his church, insanely in love with seeing souls saved. Listen, when it's all said and done, and you're standing before the Lord on judgment day, what are you going to say? When he says to you, you know, I allowed you to live 86 years, or 100 years, or 90 years, or however long it is. What did you do with your life? Well... Yeah. You know what makes me so crazy? I had a dream one time. I don't know if it was a dream or what it was. But I was standing before the Lord on Judgment Day. I've shared this with my congregations all over the place. It's what motivates me. I'm standing before the Lord, and he says, Why didn't you do what I told you to do? And I said, I just couldn't. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the people. I didn't have the strength. And he looked at me and he said, didn't you know if you'd only tried, 
I would have provided all of it for you. That's why I'm here. I'm trying. I could retire, get fatter than I am. No, uh uh, we're not doing that. You say, well, I'm old. We're all getting old. What is it that you can do that's desperately needed for the kingdom? It may be to pray, it may be to serve in some capacity, doing something. Do something. I'm just glad you came tonight. You did something. You got in a car and you drove over here. Say, I'm going to sit under the word of God. Wow. Otherwise, I'd be just preaching to myself. I'll do that. I preach to myself a lot. But now I'm imparting something to you that you can impart to somebody else. Somebody say amen. Amen. Oh, I got to hurry. I got to hurry. You know, not only did he... He was thankful for their faith, their love, their hope, that they heard the word of truth and that the gospel was being spread all over the world and they were bearing fruit, but he was thankful for Epaphras. Now, Paul is very fascinating to me because look at what he says. This is amazing. He says, as you have learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Now, think about what he just said here. He's, 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 he's elevating Epaphras. Now, all of us can tear people down. It's much harder to elevate people. My greatest yearning is to see people elevated in their work for God. Now, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to challenge you. But my greatest joy is to see you become everything God's called you to be. (laughs) What's your goal, Pastor? What's your goal? I'll tell you what my goal is. (laughs) Years ago, a prophet came to our church. Years ago. He prophesied. He said, Pastor, your church is an aircraft carrier. Your job is to get the planes flying. You're the plane. My job is to get you flying. Because if I can get you flying, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in a life group, whether it's in some ministry, if I can get you flying, we'll beat up the devil really well. He's already defeated. But we'll walk in that victory if I can get you flying. How tragic it would be that you're in a war And you have these great aircraft carriers with the power of all these planes, but nobody takes off. The pilots don't get into the plane. They like the food on the they like the food on the plane, on the on the aircraft carrier. They like just floating around on it. They never get in the plane. They never go to fight. Hello, we're in a war. And you're the airplanes. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, I got to stop. You want me to stop right now? You sure? All right. That brings us then to he goes on, and you'll notice something that he says here. I just, it, it really gets me. It really does get me. Listen to what he says. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it that is when he heard about the church he said we do not cease to pray for you now I get convicted every time I read that because he's moved now from thanksgiving into intercession and persistent intercession I've had people ask me to pray for them and I pray for them I pray for them maybe once twice two or three times I pray for them but then I pray for other people and I forget them. I'm not alone. But you'll notice here that he's praying. He's praying. 
He's praying for them. If you begin to go through Paul's letters, I did a series, maybe I'll do it here one day, entitled Praying with the Apostle Paul. And what I did was break open Paul's prayers and his prayer life. It's the most fascinating thing you've ever seen. I said, oh God, I'm not even in the ballpark. Sad to say, most of the churches in our nation are not in the ballpark when it comes to prayer. I got a call today. <laughs> oh, one of my pastors is in a place where they have a world prayer center. And they asked the pastor if they would go to the world prayer center with their people on a special night. They only do it, I think it's like uh, once a month. <laughs> and they try to rally people to come to this prayer center. Well, I mean, it's cool. They have on the floor of the whole world, and you can stand in the nation that you're praying for. I mean, it's just high-tech to the max. So she gathered about 20 or 25 people from the church, and they went. They were the only ones there. The only ones there. Our nation has forgot the power is in prayer. So for 40 years, ever since my dad started the prayer meeting when he joined my staff in 1984, we have prayed unstopped every morning for 40 years. That's the only reason we're still alive. Hey, up your prayer life. Turn to your neighbor and say, up your prayer life. Consistent prayer. And listen how he prays. And I've, I, help me, Jesus. You say, what's wrong with you? This is so rich that I feel bad that I can only give you a tidbit of it. But look at how he prays. Look at this. He prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's talking about, listen, the most important thing in your life is to do the will of God. How do you know to do the will of God? You seek him for knowledge and wisdom to do his will. Secondly, you'll notice, and this is very important, to live a life worthy of the Lord. Oh, you know that little secret sin that you have nobody knows about? <laughs> Jesus knows about it. And if you don't deal with it, everybody else is going to know about it. So I got some good news for you. Let's, let's deal with it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Live a life worthy of the Lord. Thirdly, he prays that they may please the Lord in every way oh my Lord is this pleasing to you Lord and what I do in pleasing you Lord help me to please you isn't it amazing that we can please the Lord doesn't that shock you a little bit that we can do something that pleases him and then he says growing in the knowledge bearing fruit in every good work we do good things. We try to do good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. That's what you're doing tonight. That's why you're here. You're growing in the knowledge of God. You could be watching television and getting polluted, but you came to church. And then it says being strengthened with God's power. Wow. Being strengthened with God's power. And that, that we may joy, joyfully give thanks for the privilege of being a Christian. We get to share in the inheritance that Christ has given us. We're in the kingdom of light instead of the kingdom of darkness. Somebody say amen. Well, I've got to wrap this up. What is God speaking to us about tonight? Well, turn to your neighbor and say, you're God's agent to affect our city. How many of you live in Irving? Let me see your hand. Okay. How many of you live in another city somewhere else? Let me see your hand. Okay. Now listen. Wherever you're planted, you're planted there on purpose. 
to be a light in that dark place. Now, it may not be that you're going to get on a street corner and preach. Maybe you will. Maybe that's what God will call you to do. But you're called to be a light. And we're going to be that light. Somebody say amen. amen. But there's a problem. If this church is going to be a light for this city and for the entire metroplex of Dallas, we not only need to see ourselves as God's agent collectively, but we must be holy and faithful and be a family. Now, everybody listen. Do you know why I have you join hands and find out the name of the person next to you? You say, well, because you like my hands to sweat? No. No. You know why I do that? It's because oftentimes in church, we don't know the person that we've been sitting next to for years. And I understand that. And I, I'm going to one day get all your names. I'll ask you a thousand times, but I'll get it in my brain. Now, here's the point. Listen to me. Why do we do that? Because God views us as his family. He views us as his family. Wouldn't it be horrible if you didn't know your brother or sister and you've been living with them? You didn't even know their name? You'd say, something's wrong with this boy. Yeah. And, and it's not that, listen, there was a time my memory worked a lot better than it does today. But I've always tried to be as personable as I can. That's why I always answer my phone. when I don't answer it at that moment because I may be in a meeting but I'll always call back. You call me, I'll call you back. I had my phone number in the, row, in, in the telephone directory. You know when we had the yellow pages? My phone number was in there. It was in there. And people said, you're crazy. You're a pastor of a big church, and you put your phone number in the yellow page? Yeah, because that's why I'm on Maui, so people can know the Lord. And I'd have people call me. They, they, you know, it's, it's different. I'd get calls. Is this Pastor Morocco? I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, and they'd tell me their problem. Can I tell you one story? Probably one of the most difficult things I've ever dealt with. In my office, and a lady called. She called and she said, uh, you don't know me, but my daughter came to your church. She was picked up on the bus. She came to church. Well, my daughter died, and I am here at the funeral home, and I just thought you ought to know. I didn't know this woman. Her daughter was four years old when we started picking her up. I think she was four. We picked her up at two years old. She was four years old. She died because she crawled into a dryer and suffocated to death. I didn't know the lady, didn't know. And I remember putting the phone down and saying, boy, that's a strange call. And the Holy Spirit said, you go. Now, I pastor a massive church. Don't know this lady. I got in my car, went to the, the uh, funeral home. I wasn't prepared for what I saw. Nobody was there. She was there. Her, her daughter wasn't even in a casket. She was lying on a table. And there was one person in the room, her son. And some guy who kept coming in and out, I suppose he knew her. That was it. And my heart grieved. And I, and, and I remember after that funeral, I walked through the graveyard that was there, and I cried out to God. I said, God. Help me reach people. That little girl was picked up by a, a lady in our church. And this mother that had this daughter, she constantly moved. But everywhere she moved, that lady followed her to pick her up to bring her to church and had to change her diapers and everything so that little four-year-old girl could come to church. And it was because of her that that lady called me to be there for a moment where I could share the light of Jesus. That's our job, guys. 
I had a pastor tell me when I loved crowds, but I didn't like people. I like people. One day this will be a great crowd. We won't have room enough for the people here. We just got started. But I like people. You know why? Because God likes people. Well, we're God's agents. We're going to create a family. We're going to share and bear fruit. We need to release the power of the gospel. That's why it's important for us to be open to share. One of the things that I appreciated about my staff yesterday and today, they, were, they went to the elementary schools and passed out flyers for the Easter egg hunt because they wanted to share the gospel with families. They're going to do that every day this week up until Friday. I guess tomorrow's the last day because Friday's a holiday. But I thank God for that. I pray that all of us will do that. All of us will do something. I said it before. We can be an Epaphras. You say, what do you mean be an Epaphras? I don't plan on starting a church. No, you don't have to start a church. Maybe it's just start a small group. Maybe it's just showing up in a class, and by you being there, you're encouraging somebody else to be there. Maybe it's to show up a little early and say, is there something I can do? And maybe you can greet people. Or you can help people park cars. It doesn't matter. Sing in the choir. Sing, sing worship songs. Whatever it is, but all of us do something. And you'll notice that Paul makes a big deal of how hard Epaphras worked. You'll see that in the text. But fourthly, we, cannot, we must be committed to pray to be giving thanksgiving to God and to intercede. I'm going to ask all of you to join me here. You say, Pastor, what, what will happen if we do these things? We'll impact this city. Can you imagine what it would be like if we had a thousand people praying every morning? Say, so, oh, that will never happen. I've been to Korea. What got me so started on congregational prayer is the first time I went to Korea, the largest church in the world, the Oedo Full Gospel Church. It's a church of almost a million people. I preached in Olymp Olympic Stadium with 100,000 people sitting there. For, they were there two or, two or three hours doing prayer. I stood on a stage where a million people gathered to pray. That'll shake you to your core. And when they prayed, they didn't just meditate on their navel. They prayed out loud. It almost felt like the roof was going to fly off. In fact, I brought a group of people from Maui. They stayed in the hotel across the street. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, they were awakened by the noise of the people in the church across the street praying in the early morning prayer meeting. Most prayer meetings, you sleep for half an hour. <laughs> we're going to pack this city. We're going to impact it by our praying. We're going to impact it by our sharing the gospel. We're going to impact it by being a family. We're going to impact it by being an, an, an Epaphras. Michael, you'd be an Epaphras like you've been on Maui in transformation and in Kihei. Continue to do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother and Sister Salazar, be an Epaphras. Right? Hallelujah. Tanya. Santos. I'm going to have to call you Epaphras. Be that. Barbara. Becky. Go on down the list. You say, well, I'm just not that spiritual. Well, then be that spiritual. <laughs> That's why we're here. Oh, I've, I've screamed and hollered enough. Stand to your feet. Come on. Hey, let's put into practice some things. Can we? Our time, I've got.